It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 322 of Science on Top. Today's Monday, the 11th of February, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And we are halfway through our 10-week campaign supporting the Fred Hollows Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. This is in memory of Penelope Green, a close friend of ours and a fan of the show. She sadly passed away late last year and we're donating all of the Patreon contributions we get for 10 weeks to those charities in her honour. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. And before we start, we are also making a bit of a change this year to the format of the show. Rather than try and put out an episode every week for a whole year, we're switching to seasons. So we'll sort of do maybe two months on and then uh, have a break for a month and then come back for the next season just to try and avoid a bit of the burnout that we're sort of feeling and uh, trying not to pod fade, which is when podcasts get so overrun that they end up just sort of fading out and ceasing to be. So we're not going to let that happen. We're going to be here as long as we can. We're just going to space things out a little bit. So on with the show and Penny, let's talk a bit about uh, some, some very old teeth. And we can learn a lot about an animal's diet from looking at its teeth. The shape will tell us if it's likely to be a herbivore, a carnivore, or omnivore. But of course, little particles of food on the teeth are the best clue. But when researchers from the Max Planck Institute were looking at the teeth of a 11th or 12th century German woman, they found tiny bright blue specks that they were not expecting to find. What were they and why were they there? Yeah, I read this article over the summer and this was just such a, a wonderful story for me. So this um, medieval woman, um, who we don't know her name, lived in a religious community and those little tiny blue specks had been identified as um, lapis lazuli, which is a stone that is used to make a blue pigment. Now, it was a really, really rare pigment and a really, really rare stone. And the idea is that how would this get into her teeth? Like it's not part of her diet. And the idea is that it seems most likely that what she was doing was um, illuminating manuscripts or writing or drawing the pictures that um, were in those beautiful sort of medieval manuscripts. And not only was she uh, doing that, but she was using some very, very precious materials. I think it, it said that this was more precious than gold. It only came from Af Afghanistan. It had to come across, you know, large distances in trade routes and be processed and everything to get used. So that in itself is interesting that we can trace not just some things about her life through her skeleton. It seems that she, she was... Um, led a pretty good life. She didn't have any obvious skeletal trauma, any signs of like massive infections or anything like that. And that she seemed to have this job. And I think it's really interesting, not only that, you know, there's this weird blue stuff, like once it's been identified as this, it seems all very neat and obvious and interesting, but I would certainly be a bit surprised if I found it yeah. that was um, in her mouth. But it's also interesting because it really sheds a little bit more light on the medieval world. And one of the things I always found fascinating about archaeology is that when we're using it, I think when we discussed last year, you know, the, the oldest drawings or whatever it was, and there's absolutely no other evidence and that's all mm. we've got. But at a time like medieval times, um, when we do have a lot of textual evidence, like maybe not as much as we have for more recent times. But there is, you know, a lot has been written, a lot of history, a lot of art and depictions have survived. We also have a kind of idea of what things were like that's passed through into the current day, whether that's accurate or not. 
And because written accounts can be so vivid, they can really shape our imagination of what a time was like. But, you know, written accounts were always written for certain audiences with certain purposes by certain groups of people. They weren't necessarily written so that people, you know, almost a thousand years later could understand what was going on. And so we know or we think that the number of books that were actually like physically written by female scribes before the 12th century was very, very low, like less than 1%. And yet here's this woman who has really been doing quite what seems to be quite high status work. I mean, if she was entrusted with this pigment, she wasn't just any old person. Like she must have been quite, I, I don't know. I, want, I don't really want well, to use the word professional, <laughs> but you know, someone who was quite skilled at her job and worthy of trusting with such expensive pigments. But at so the same time, yeah. I think it is interesting that they there was nothing about the grave or anything to suggest mm. that she was held as in a particularly high status person. There was no sort of, you know, no. ornamental things to suggest that she was revered or anything. I think she was just a very good artist who was... Yeah, working at yeah. her convent or whatever sort of religious community it was and producing books just as part of her her life. And, and that sort of thing wouldn't get recorded because I think for religious reasons, you know, often those artworks were not signed and especially not by women. And then, of course, we can then assume, oh, maybe everything that's not signed by a woman was made by a man because... It was a man's world. Most, it was a man's world. But it shows that, no, there were, you know, there was at least one woman who was, you know, who had access to this expensive pigment, who was, um, you know, dipping her brush into it, shaping her brush with her lips as she painted... Um, repeatedly and enough to get it you know caught into the calculus on her teeth and to survive and so yeah I just I just really like this and I like the idea of using um you know the the teeth calculus to sort of track people's professions and to get that extra kind of layer of insight it's it's a really interesting um skeletal marker <laughs> to do with art like, because yeah. I mean, the ones to do with grinding or really repetitive big movements are quite obvious. But yeah, like licking a paintbrush, who would have thought? That's the thing that I like about it yeah. so much is it's just this unexpected find. This, yeah. you know, you, they, I can just imagine when they first looked at it and they just would have gone, what the? What like, is this? How could this be? Who spilt their bloody <laughs> Um, yeah. And it also, there was quite a bit of detective work for them to mm. figure out what was going on because I was sort of thinking, there was this uh, reverential uh, worship sort of happening a little bit later on where you would ha have a book that was something special, a religious text or whatever, that you would be kissing uh, to show mm. your love and reverence to God. And I thought maybe that's what was going on. But then they looked and there, there's no record of that ever happening at that time. That was sort of something that happened much later. Mm. And there's the detective process of how would you get this rare uh, mineral that's only yeah. found in Afghanistan to get there would have had to travel up through well, essentially along the Silk Road through the Islamic world who were the only people who could refine it so well mm. it would have made its way into Venice and from there traded throughout Europe how would that then get to the mouth of this woman it's extraordinary when you think about it and just a really cool piece of detective work I love it yeah I love these kinds of um, finds that really are able to draw different kind, different like really multiply, multidisciplinary kind of um, hmm. work. That's the other thing. If you're, you know, an archaeologist or a, someone even specialising in archaeological dentistry and teeth and everything, you'd still then have to become an expert in medieval artistry and mm. the mineral process of making these pigments and things. It's so cool. It is cool. <laughs> I really liked it. All right. Well, let's move on and talk about uh, some some training because we've all heard of Pavlov's dog, uh, the Russian physiologist who trained dogs to salivate every time a bell was rung. Every time you'd ring the bell, you'd give them food. Eventually, the dogs associate the ringing of the bell with food. They start to drool just at the sound of the bell. Well, what if you were to do the same thing but with plants? Lucas, tell us how to train your plant. <laughs> Is that a how to train your dragon sort of yeah. reference? <laughs> it was a very bad one, but yeah. Awesome. Excellent. So uh, we've covered before 
some weird things about plants, particularly the way that they're able to interact with the world world around them in in ways that you know are not obvious. I mean, you look at a you look at a tree, you look at a plant, you look at a you know yeah. any green thing, and you think to yourself, well, it's just sort of sitting there. And it, you know, some some plants you can recognise some you know changes in them in very short time frames. So, for example, if you've ever done those those school sort of science experiments, home experiments, where you've grown, um, you know, you've taken the, the the chopped off end from a carrot and let it grow in a in a in a dish with cotton wool, or you've grown um, like little pea shoots and stuff like that. You can see them changing on a daily basis. So, you know, they're they're, they're quite rapid response to things. And of course, things like um, bamboo. If you've ever had bamboo in your garden, you'll know that bamboo in your garden is not a great thing because bamboo in your garden rapidly becomes bamboo in everyone else's <laughs> garden. Um, it, really, really freaky how fast that stuff grows. So other than that, we don't tend to think of them as, as I guess, sensing beings, mm. but we have done stories in the past about uh, plants responding to, for example, um, being munched upon by, uh, you know, if, the, if, if nearby trees or, or flowers or whatever are, are under attack from some sort of insect muncher, um, then, then they, can, they can emit uh, chemicals which are, which are detected by other, other plants nearby who can then, in response to that, change something about their, their chemical makeup in their flowers or, or their fruit or whatever, whatever, to, to turn those insects off. They can also, as we've seen before, they can actually influence, other, uh, influence each other apparently through sort of like a network of fungi that connects their root systems, um, which we, we, I think we've touched on on the show before as well, which is just ultra, ultra cool. Mm. It kind of makes me think of the sci-fi, you know, fantasy world of, of moving forests, of, of you know, the ants and triffids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so that you know, there's there's been a few of these things in the past that we've that we've uh, we've covered. And another one that we have not covered, which I read in uh, just preparing for this story, was apparently there's been uh, experiments, uh, experimental observation of um, plants reacting to the vibrations caused by the beating of bees' wings, um, and even recordings of the sound of, of bees' wings beating, and within three minutes, they can pump up significantly the amount of um, pollen that the, the bees are after. So basically, they, release, they, they can release pollen only when, when the bees are landing on them and they buzz at the right frequency. And of course, this means that they can save that up and they're, they're not wasting resources, which is, which is pretty cool. Wow. I know. <laughs> so anyway, a, 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 a group led by um, Dr. Monica Gagliano from University of Sydney um, who uh, looked at she, – she's actually an animal uh, biologist, but she looked at um, – she, she had a look at plants to see whether there, there were similar reactions to certain stimuli. And I actually tweeted about this a couple of weeks ago um, from the Psychoma U uh, Twitter account because it really, really caught my attention where she did, you know, exactly as you described in the intro there, that, that Pavlov's dog sort of uh, experiment where um, uh, Pavlov, uh, Ivan Pavlov had, had conditioned the dog, you know, to, to react to the sound of a bell. Um, she basically did a similar thing with with pea uh, shoots, pea little you know um, small pea plants, where she positioned a fan in random places around these peas each day, and then after having the fan blow on the peas for a certain amount of time or the pea leaves, she would then put blue light in the same place as where the fan had been. Now the important thing here is a Plants do like blue light. They need it to grow. So, so blue light is important to plants as a part of their, their daily cycle. Um, but we also know that plants don't typically care all that much about wind. It's not really a factor other than, you know, just the, the wind can affect the way that certain trees grow and so forth. If there's prevailing winds, you'll often see this on the co in coastal regions um, with, with trees that are sort of blown from offshore breezes all the time. But other than that, it's not really a big part of their I should say we don't think it's a big part of the thing. Who who knows? Maybe maybe that's the next discovery. But as far as we know, wind doesn't make a big difference to them. So um, 
so she was taking this this uh, scenario of the you know a fan here. Then we replace the fan with blue lights, and then the, and then the next day we put the fan in a different place. We replace it with blue light, and after quite a short time, she found that when she would set up the fan, the tree would orient itself because they can sort of you know change the direction of their leaves and stuff like that in anticipation of the blue light being there. That's pretty freaking cool. Wow! Because if you think about it, yeah, if you think about it. What what is it's, how does a tree learn? Like how it doesn't have neurons, it doesn't have a brain. How is it actually learning this Pavlovian response to stimuli and saying, okay, well I can utilize this information to my benefit because if I know that you know this cause and effect leads to this outcome, then I can save energy. That's freaking awesome. That's very. I mean, that's cool. just ridiculous. <laughs> it also made me start to think about, and I, I know I mentioned to this uh, to you on one of our walks about um, what what might be the future moral and ethical complications for for vegetarians and vegans who are, who, who have made that choice for for animal rights. I, I, that's my blowing to me as well. That's a whole that's probably a whole different type of show to the one that we do, but uh, but interesting nonetheless. So that's not all. She took this experiment a little bit further and decided, okay, well, what about um, let's see if the plants can react to other stimuli. So knowing that they can react to sound with the beating of the bee's wings, as I mentioned before, um, the, it's long been known that plants will seek out, the roots of plants, root systems of plants will seek out and often destroy um, water pipes. Um, this is an ongoing issue with water pipes in, in you know, in, on our uh, residential properties. This is a part of the reason we have to engage plumbers to come and fix these things mm. when plants, you know, f- seek out and destroy these water pipes. Now, the thing is, plants actually grow towards many water pipes, which is very interesting. Um, it's long been assumed that it was a response to humidity, which personally I find a bit weird because hopefully the pipes are sealed why mm. how would mm. humidity get out but okay putting that to the side i can see it happening with certain clay pipes and ag pipes and stuff like that because they've got they've got gaps in them so all right so um but what she did was she actually recorded the sound of water and she substituted you know real pipes with real water inside of them with um with basically just you know uh pipes that emitted the sound of water and they grew in that direction and you can actually see uh, on one of the links, you can see um, photographs of that that design where where they had you know on one side is here is the pipe that has water sounds in it. Here is a pipe that has no sounds in it, and you can see that the the plant roots are definitely growing towards the one with sound in it. So effectively, wow. growing towards the sound of trickling water in the pipes. Now she also tried some other sounds in the pipes, things like white noise, for example. And although there was a little bit of an effect for that, it was nowhere near as significant as the as the as the water uh sounds in attracting the the plant roots so that's amazing pretty cool i know so very very early days with this sort of thing she's you know there have already been some some criticism uh of of the hypotheses here um obviously this is going to take a little bit of time before other people can you know come up with other experiments and you know some people might might try and replicate her own so it is very early days uh i don't really know what to take from this at the moment other than just sheer Mm mind-boggling mouth hanging open (laughs) wonder uh, which was my reaction, but uh, but yeah, that's that's really really cool. I'm very curious what the uh, criticism that she's received has been because I'm trying to think of how this could have gone wrong or what else could be happening here. But it seems pretty clear cut uh, experiments, but I haven't thought too carefully about it. You'd think so, but I mean, you uh, without knowing without I mean, these articles didn't go into a great deal of detail about the experimental design. There 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 might I don't know if there are um, biases that 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 have to be ruled out from this type of thing i don't know what the controls would be for this type of thing or even if it's been replicated anywhere else yeah which i don't think it has so so who knows there there could be a whole lot of stuff there but i think from from reading the 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 couple of articles that i or the few articles i read about this it does seem that the um the knee-jerk reaction has been well that's preposterous you know, mm. that seems to be the level of criticism. It's like, don't be absurd. There must be some other explanation for this. That's a familiar so, um, response from the scientific community, it actually. Is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. And the thing is, that's part of what 
is important about science. Absolutely. You know, we have that it, it's built in skepticism is a feature. Um, you know, that's why we don't rapidly change our ideas about whatever the the, the current leading you know um, diet description of what. Right, whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Diet's probably not a great one to use an example there because that seems to change every week about, okay, scientists recommend this. No, now they recommend that. In fact, you shouldn't touch those. Actually, you should be having more chocolate, less chocolate, okay. more coffee, less coffee. Everything gives you cancer. Maybe um, there's a but – that, that, but I guess that is the point, that the waters get muddied until we end up with clear-cut, um, hard and fast rules, I guess. But, yeah, all right, maybe not the best example. Yeah. The waters do get muddied and they make sounds. <laughs> and that's why the uh, the plants grow towards them, potentially. But I, I am seeing this being used by, like, landscape designers and artists, you know, trying to make p plants grow in spirals and particular designs. Oh, yeah. Just over time, you move a light or a fan or something. Yeah, yeah. She, Dr. Gagliano herself suggested that there are implications, for example, with Water vapor design. Okay, what if it if it turns out that sound is actually one of the main things that what that that roots are, are attracted to? Should we be considering different materials for our pipes that mm, basically confer some level of, of soundproofing? You know, we eventually we're going to replace the pipes anyway. So if we're doing it, maybe we should replace them with soundproof pipes or you know vibration proof or whatever. Pipes with those little egg carton pointy bits to isolate yeah. the sound. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's very cool. Um, definitely one to follow up on and see if it does get replicated and if uh, there are any interesting objections to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on and talk about spiders. And it's probably no surprise that they sense the world around them differently to us. Rather than have a nose, they detect smell with sensitive hairs on their legs. Instead of listening with ears, they hear vibrations with hairs on their legs. They don't taste things with their mouths. You guessed it, they detect chemicals with hairs on their legs. But they also use their actual web as a sensory organ too. Penny, can you tell us a bit about that and why their posture can affect their spidey sense? Yeah, I thought this was really, really interesting because I had known, of course, well, not of course, but you know, that, that spiders could pick up vibrations through their web. So, you know, if they detect... Uh, that some prey or something has fallen on the web and got tangled, they can detect that and go to it. And I knew also that they almost could like pl not play their web like an instrument, but, you know, position themselves, their, their limbs around on the web to sort of see where things are coming from and listen to different parts of the web. Um, and webs apparently can also be almost tuned so you can, or it's not you, sorry, a spider can spin a web that will pick up on certain frequencies or certain sections of the web can pick up on certain frequencies of vibrations that, um, you know, can indicate different things going on in the environment or near the web. But what I found really interesting about this research is that often like vibration sensing organs like ears or in the spider's case, these organ, these um, structures called um, slits and cilla. So they're kind of like slits, slits in the um, spider's outer kind of exoskeleton that when there's a movement, uh, they've got these very sensitive cells inside them. As the cracks narrow and widen, the cells detect it and send that message through to the spider's nervous system. So it's kind of like, you know, how in our ears we have those little hairs that detect movement and they send that mm -hmm. message through. But mm -hmm. the spider is sensing things from a solid state, not through the air. And what this research has found is that it's not enough perhaps to just look at the web and so on and study the sensilla in isolation. Because what this has shown is that a spider that hangs from its web, it can tune different joints to different frequency. So the actual sensilla themselves are very generalized, but when the spider changes its posture, it essentially can retune what, sensitive, what frequencies it's most sensitive to. So if it's got its body horizontal and its legs outstretched, that's one thing, that's all that normal. But if it crouches, and draws in its legs, it can become sensitive to higher frequencies. 
So there's this idea of embodied cognition. So we often think of, you know, our brain as doing the thinking and everything. It's like this really hierarchical model, you know, the brain is the computer and the blah, blah, blah and everything. But that's not necessarily the case. And even if it seems to be dominantly the case, or it's a useful model, I should say, to think about human cognition, it's not the case hmm. for other animals to that same extent. So, Well, we've talked about octopuses and things. Yeah. That's distributed nervous system, so their tentacles can do part of the thinking for them. So. Yeah, like the tentacle, the, mess, the tentacles can do stuff. It doesn't even have to go to the brain. And other organisms have, you know, neural nets or, you know, ring ganglia and th so on. There's not necessarily this really big, hi this, you know, extreme hierarchy that you see with, you know, how large the human brain is. But even with us, if you think about our, the nervous system, you know, in our guts, I mean, mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. time we do a story on that, we're finding out more and more about what that does and how that, you know, controls large parts of our body function. But back to yeah. the spider. <laughs> so the spider is essentially using its posture uh, to sort of modify the sensory information that it can get from its web and about its environment. This article was by Ed Yong, and he had compared it to a squint. You know, if you squint, you can sometimes get a clearer view of something. Mm -hmm. It's a similar analogy, but not quite, because that squint is helping us focus on a part of space. But for a spider changing its posture, it's more like, you know, if you squat down, suddenly you can see red a whole lot better. Yeah. If you, you know, you do that power pose and then all of a sudden high-pitched sounds are really clear to you. So I think that's, that's a fascinating kind of um, finding. Like it's not something I would have enjoyed studying. <laughs> not a spider fan. <laughs> uh, not a spider fan, not a Black Widow spider fan, that's for sure. But you know, um, <laughs> I, th I think it's it's I'm another glad someone's done it. <laughs> of course, it's just another sort of example of who would have thought that other animals mm. aren't carbon copies of us, and they don't think the same way we do. They don't interpret the world the same way we do. Who would have thought that we're not the baseline that all life revolves around? <laughs> yeah, and also that you know. The models that we use to explain things, and I know we've we've talked about this before. You know, like apparent. You know, I haven't experienced this myself, but you know, fifty years ago, sixty years ago, I don't know, probably even longer now. It was like, oh, you know, the nervous system is like a telephone exchange, mm. and now it's like a computer. And you know, the analogies that we use to understand things mm. can, um, they can really blind affect us to the reality. Can blind, yeah, blind us what's going on. I mean, now maybe we'll start to say, oh, the nervous system is like the internet and there's no real central point, even though there's definitely servers and I have no idea. I don't no. know enough about the nervous system or the internet. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I think things like that are good analogies when you're trying to communicate an idea, particularly to yeah. a layperson. But to a scientist, perhaps they're not useful methods of thought. Or maybe they are. Maybe with those sort of shorthands, you can leap to other conclusions. Yeah. I think it's but they can certainly, as you said, they can, especially if when you were a lay person, as we all were to start with, you learned that analogy. It can be a very powerful thing that sticks with you, even when you maybe it's time to abandon it. Well, let's talk about Earth's magnetic pole now, shall we? And we've, we've talked before about how it's kind of, sort of, maybe due for a flip or a polar reversal at some point between now and the next few hundred thousand years. It does move around a bit. The North Pole, the North Pole's been drifting lazily around for the last few hundred years that we've got accurate records for. But Lucas, it's no longer quite so erratic, is it? It now seems to have almost purpose, at least direction, doesn't it? It if if what is happening now happened prior to the creation of GPS systems this would have been a really big problem. Um, basically, as, as you said just then, for a very long time, over 400 years, we've, we've basically known, and one of the best sources of um, information about this is actually ship logs, um, as in the, you know, the logs that captains and, and, and their crew have written out mm -hmm. from their navigation charts. 
Um, Captain's the- log. That is. Star- <laughs> 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 Exactly, those logs. Um, we, we know, you know, there's a lot of detailed uh, information in those logs about weather conditions and climate and and uh, uh, encounters in the sea, but also the uh, position of magnetic north. Now, magnetic north, unlike the um, uh, the, the uh, geo uh, north, is um, it moves around, and it's 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 actually just a bit of a um, a coincidence almost or, or a byproduct of the of the earth's spin which spins on an axis the top of the axis is the is the geographical north pole but the uh the polar uh, the, the sorry the uh, magnetic north pole is is isn't very neat so this the north and south pole for example don't come out of the earth directly opposite each other on the globe and they don't go through the center of the earth um, so as a result, the both of them move around, and as you said, they they occasionally flip as well. Interesting fact, something I hadn't really considered to, towards today. We call it the North Pole um, colloquially, colloquially because the uh, the needle of a compass, the north northern needle of the compass, is attracted to it. So it's actually the South Magnetic Pole, which is I never really thought of that until today. Um, oh, that's good to be. It's attracted to the, to the yeah yeah so um, so it's actually it, it's 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 uh, compared to a magnet it's actually the South Pole but anyway that's by the by I, I just found that interesting so yeah. it's that'll just confuse people if you start talking like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so uh, so we know that it's been pretty stable for the past four hundred or so years uh, up until about say 50 years ago when it started to move north it was sort of you know hanging around northern canada for a really long time and i was uh i was in the military in the military we uh learned among other things how to read maps and one of the the important um characteristics of of a of a map particularly a topographic map is if you're if you're using compasses to uh, find direction and to to get bearings and so forth you need to be able to convert the magnetic bearing that you take with your compass to the actual you know um, geographic north of the map because the map uh, it's it's got the la- lines of latitude and longitude and those lines are oriented with north south east west so you you actually you know you need to reorient yourself and as a result every map has written or every topographic map has written on the side of it the amount of um, uh, magnetic shift to calculate per year so you look at the year the map was was uh, produced and then you you um, you work out the difference between that year and now so how many years that's been and then you times you you you, you uh, multiply the uh, um, uh, north uh, position by the number of years by whatever the factor is that's on that particular map and and the factor changes depending on where you are on the globe so for example if you're really really high north like if you're in Canada or you're in the north of Scotland or you know up in the Nordic regions that factor will be very very high because a change in the North Pole when you're really high on the globe will, will you know cause many degree change in your in your compass uh, direction but if you're further south on the planet then that change is is minimized because overall compared to the size of your map where you are on the on the earth and how far away the north pole is it's not as big a change you might be you know a fraction of a degree change so back to what i said earlier where if this had happened a number of years ago this would have been more of a problem when we were really a lot more reliant on compasses in order to do basic navigation and that included things like aircraft shipping land navigation where we went on roads and things like that this was a really really big deal so what's happening now is uh unlike in the in you know over most of our recorded history where the north pole hasn't moved around all that much it's suddenly marching very very quickly north so uh, up to about 50 years ago it started uh, more of a move to the north rather than an oscillation because it was sort of going backwards and forwards prior to that. Um, but in the last 30 years, it's basically really started to hoof it. And it's it went from moving, you know, around five or, or so um, kilometres, um, you know, a year up to over 50 or 60 kilometres in a single year today. And that's a that's a you know that that's quite a big change. It's a huge jump, 
and yeah. and it's and it's heading in a particular direction. It's basically heading towards Siberia. So if you picture the top of the globe, you're looking down. You've got uh, you know the, the the top of Canada on one side, on the other side you've got the the top of Russia and and so forth. That's where it's heading. It's heading over to the to you know the the, the north of Siberia. So basically, it will what's cr- so exciting in Siberia? What is there that's a ch- is it just a juke? I don't know. Why would they you know be- something? Go I don't know. There. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> I, I did catch that uh, that reference there. Yeah. Um, I, I almost wish you had <laughs> Skyhooks reference. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's heading there quite quickly now. Um, this this does have uh, repercussions, and, and the the most recent repercussion and why this has been in the news is there's a thing called the World Magnetic Model. Uh, very imaginatively named and, and, you know, clearly not by astronomers because it makes total sense. The World Magnetic Model does, as you would expect, describe the magnetic model for the world. Uh, and and uh, generally it gets updated, um, you know, every every five years or so. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the group of, of bodies that, that collaborate on this model met recently because it was um, it was thought that actually rather than waiting until the next update, which should have been I think next year, they had to meet early to um, uh, to you know update the model based on on how quickly the North Pole is moving around. So um, basically, we'll be updating this. I suspect if it continues at this uh, rate of change, we'll be updating it a little bit more regularly than the the every five years that it used to be. So yeah, that's uh, that's basically the 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 long and the um, you know the protracted version of the story. It's moving. We don't really know why. Uh, it's believed that there's a. They described it as as like a um, almost like a, a stream of of um, uh, of magnetic molten metal. yeah molten metal that was that was being shot, you know, inside the earth towards Siberia and disrupting the pole. That seems a bit clumsy to me. I, I can't see that sort of happening in that way. Not Certainly not the way that it sounds when you're reading it. Um, you know, we know that the – or we believe that the, the magnetic um, – uh, you know the the magnetosphere of the Earth is is caused by its uh, the Earth's outer core, which we think is a is an iron nickel core that's that's basically liquid. And so, if you get a, a liquid metal and you and you turn it, it creates you know it generates magnetic fields. So um, so you know it seems that something's something's on the move, something's moving around, and you know this could be partly to, to do with the Earth's wobble. We know that the Earth doesn't. Uh, rotate, you know, on on its axis perfectly. There is a bit of a wobble. Um, there's been things like uh, we've discussed on the show before, uh, vast movements of water that have an impact on on the the Earth's rotation rate and also its wobble. It has this precession that occurs every year anyway. Where you know, if you if you think of the top of the Earth pointing at the North Star uh, at Polaris. Um, that North Star changes over time. It changes partly because the Earth has a precession as it wobbles, and also partly because things move around in the in the in the galaxy. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it might be a combination of, of of a lot of these things. But why it's suddenly sped up is particularly interesting. Is it a sign of a flip? You know, we, we've we've been talking dun, for dun, years dun. about. <laughs> yeah, been talking for years about the flip being occurring. Um, it, it, there's there's nothing, no reason to assume that it's that's anything that's going to happen soon. And if it does flip, we know that there would be a long period of, of becoming weaker. The um, uh, the magnet- magnetosphere would become weaker. That has implications for um, for for our atmosphere and for life and so forth. And yeah, telecommunications. Um, yeah has a lot of implications, but the whole process will probably take about a thousand years. And we know that because we can look at um, uh, alignment of, of um, magnetic particles within um, magma that, that was set a long time ago. So all throughout Earth's history, any crust that we can find that's got lava, set lava on it, um, basically, you can you can have a look at it and see what the orientation of these magnetic filaments are that are inside the the magma, and that tells you where what the magnetic field was like at the time that the that the lava erupted and then set. So we have a really good um, map uh, and 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 time frame of of when the the, the, the poles are flipped, and uh, yeah, it's not not going to happen overnight, but it will weaken o- over time. So yeah. Um, 
just interesting. But as I said, you know, being given my background and, and exposure to uh, uh, navigation, it certainly occurred to me that this would have been a huge big deal for us, um, you know, before the advent of, and the invention of, of GPS because um, we really, really relied on, on, um, on compasses then. Still do in some technologies, but not to the same degree. Well, I think we still do, and it's still an important thing to be aware of, which is why I, I think you mentioned that the group that's doing this model have accelerated it and released it a year earlier that's right. than normal, because obviously this is unprecedented and deserves further study. So very cool. We'll see what happens. And that's our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 322. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. And for this week and the next four, we're giving all donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Educate and elect leaders who believe in science and understand the importance of protecting nature. Stop, for God's sake, the denigration of science. Stop giving power to people who don't believe in science, or worse than that, pretend they don't believe in science for their own self-interest. They know who they are. We know who they are. We are all rich or poor, powerful or powerless. We will all suffer the effects of climate change and ecosystem destruction. And we are facing what is quickly becoming the greatest moral crisis of our time, that those least responsible will bear the greatest costs.